Welcome to the research paper's finals in live judging presented by Ticketmaster. My name is Adam Trena. I'm the research paper's team lead. And I'd like to start by thanking all of the academic and student reviewers who worked through over 200 submissions and a double blind review process to bring you the final four. Our live judges are Professor Ed Tufte of Yale University, Nate Silver, who needs no further introduction, uh, John Farisi, Senior Vice President and General, Master, General Manager at Ticketmaster, and John Hennessy of the Houston Rockets. It's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Pettigrew, who is the finalist from the other sports track. Thanks. Wait for them to get my slides up there. There we go. Hey, everybody. My name is Stephen Pettigrew. I am a PhD student at Harvard. And today, I'm going to be talking about some of my hockey research in a talk I call Assessing the Offensive Productivity of NHL Players Using In-Game Win Probabilities. So I'm going to start the talk with a hypothetical situation. I want you to imagine that you're an NHL general manager and that you're looking to add some goal scoring talent before Monday's trade deadline. And you have two potential players that you're looking to acquire. And these are both real players. They're both forwards. They're both 24 years old. They have similar goal scoring numbers this season. Player A has 15 goals this season. Player B has 16. In their career, they have similar goal scoring rates. Player B is slightly higher than player A, but they're about the same. And then their Corsi statistic, which is uh, kind of the state of the art right now in hockey, they're pretty similar as well. Um, the player A's is, is slightly higher than player B's. So based on this information, it would be really difficult to, to figure out which player you want to acquire if you're looking for a goal scorer. So the question then is, who should you trade for? And the answer I'm going to give you in this talk is that you should trade for the player who scores his goals in bigger moments. And put another way, you want to trade for the player who's more clutch. And so clutchness is this idea we have in sports that a lot of sports fans believe in, which is that certain players perform in big moments. And so added goal value, which is a new statistic that I'm going to introduce today, it measures clutchness by weighting the goals based on how big of an impact they have on the team's chances of winning the game. So my talk has three parts. First, I'm going to introduce a second-by-second -second win probability model. And I'm going to go through three specific things that make this model novel. Then I'm going to show how this model could be used by journalists or by bloggers or by fans to get a better understanding of exactly what happened in the game and to build narratives about the game. And then lastly, I'll show how this model can be used to create this added goal value metric and, and how that works with evaluating players. So right now, in the hockey world, the analytics aren't very great. There's the journalists and analysts don't have the tools that are available to people in other sports. And one of these tools is having a second-by-second -second win probability metric that tells you exactly who's going to win at each point in the game. So the first novel thing about my metric is that it's the only one available out there in hockey right now. I take into account the current score, power play situations, home ice advantage, and some other things to create second-by-second -second odds of who's going to win the game. The second thing about my metric that's novel is how I deal with power plays. So anybody who's used the NHL's play-by-play -play data knows that there, the data doesn't include information about how long is remaining on power plays at each, at each point in the game. You have to back it out using when the penalties occur. So I created an algorithm that takes when the penalties occur, incorporates all the nuances of what, what's in the NHL's rulebook and how we deal with things like line brawls and, and, and unusual situations. And the algorithm then spits out exactly how much time is left on a five on four or a five on three at every point in the game. So this, this in and of itself is useful for research potentially for teams who want to who wanna better understand power play strategies or penalty killing strategies. So the third innovation then is, uh, is that my model provides a flexible framework which can unify together a lot of the work being done in hockey analytics. So that what's in red up there represents the probability that a goal is scored during some period of time. So if you had a statistic you wanted to include in this metric, all you need to know is how that statistic impacts goal scoring rates, and you can include it. So you could imagine you have a model that says, when Sidney Crosby is on the ice, this is the goal scoring rate, and compares that to when a fourth line player is on the ice, and it's much lower. All you need is a model, and it can fit into my metric. 
You could imagine things like zone starts, Corsi and Fenwick statistics, as well as kind of the holy grail here is using tracking or spatial data and incorporating that into this model. So this is what the, this is the results from one, one particular game back in October. And I picked this game because it's an unusual back and forth game. So this is between Dallas and Philadelphia. With about five and a half minutes left, Philadelphia tied the game. And when they tied the game, Dallas's win probability dropped by 38 percentage points. About 30 seconds later, Dallas retook the lead. Their chances of winning increased by 39 percentage points. And then Philly retied it just a couple minutes after that, and Dallas's chance of winning dropped by 41 percentage points. So for a journalist or blogger writing about just how crazy a back and forth this game was in the last few minutes, they could use this information and this data to get at that. They also, the metric also tells you how costly penalties are. So Dallas took a penalty right at the end of regulation, and when they did, their chances of winning dropped by nine percentage points. So a team could potentially use this part of the metric to assess you know, exactly which players are taking the most costly penalties. So here's another application. This is adapting the game probability model to create a playoff series probability model. So the black line here represents LA's probability of winning last year's Western Conference Finals at every second during the series. So in game two, LA was down one game to none, and they were losing in game two, and they only had a 14% chance of winning the series. By game five, they were up three games to one, had a lead in game five, and had a 95% chance of moving on to the next round. But that all decayed by game seven. They were losing with a few minutes left and had only a 12% chance of winning. Of course, you might remember they tied the game in regulation and won it. But this gives you an idea of just how back and forth this series was. So I take the results from the win probability model, and in particular, I take the shifts that occur when goals happen to create this metric I call added goal value. And the intuition of added goal value is that not all goals are created equal. And what I mean by that is when the game is 5 nothing, if you score a sixth goal, that goal is less valuable to your team than if you had scored a goal in overtime. So traditional statistics like total goals and goal scoring rates mask this fact by treating every goal as equally important. And added goal value uses win probabilities to measure the significance of each goal. And so players with high added goal value can be thought of as more clutch. So I'm going to show you the results here. On the x-axis, we have goals per game, which is just the traditional statistic. And on the y-axis is added goal value. So the zero line here represents a player who has average added goal value. And what that means is that on average, his goals are contributing 17 percentage points to his team's chances of winning, which is the league average for goals. So when you're above the zero line, you're a more clutch player. And when you're below the zero line, you're a less clutch player. So I'm going to push those labels out to the side and show you the scatter plot here. So this is all forward since the 2005-2006 season. And I'll point out some names here. So at the top there, we have Datsuk, Briere, Oposo, Erickson, and the Koivu brothers. These are all players who have decent goal scoring rates. But the thing that makes them unique is that when they score goals, they come in big moments, in high leverage moments. Over here, we have Ovechkin, Kovalchuk, Gabrik. These three players score a ton of goals, and their goals tend to come in big moments. Just below them are Steven Stamkos, Sidney Crosby, and Jerome McGinley, three players who score lots of goals, but they're more average on the added goal value metric. The thing I should emphasize here is that the metric is not telling us that you'd rather have Sacco Koivu on your team than Sidney Crosby. Crosby scores a ton of goals, and every time he scores, it's increasing his team's chances of of by about 17 percentage points of winning the game. What the metric is useful for is comparing players who have similar goal scoring rates and distinguishing between them. So Oposo, Brian Little, and Curtis Glencross, each of them score about 20 to 25 goals a season. But Oposo gets his goals in big moments, whereas Glencross maybe gets them in garbage time. So let's go back then to where we started. We have these two players that we're trying to decide between, and we're going to use added goal value to distinguish between them. So player B has a higher added goal value this season. He's a plus 40, whereas player A is a minus 42. And then across their careers, player B is also better. He has a plus 198 compared to player A's minus 88. So something I should emphasize here is that added goal value has pretty good predictive power across seasons. The added goal value for a player in, in season one is correlated with their added goal value in season two at about the same rate as Fenwick and Corsi statistics, which are right now taken as the best, best evaluative tool of players. So who are these two players? Player A is Nazem Kadri of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Player B is Matt Duchesne of the Colorado Avalanche. So I would say based on added goal value, you want Duchesne on your team rather than Kadri. So a few next steps as I wrap up here. Things I'd like to do. I'd like to enrich the win probability metric by adding more statistics. 
like to turn the playoff series probabilities into Stanley Cup probabilities, as well as look at playoff qualification probabilities. Adapt added goal value to the shootout and evaluate sh which players should be on the ice in a particular moment in the shootout, or even goalies. Like to add assist to the added goal value metric. And then I'd, I'd, I, in the future, I'd also like to create an interactive web app that, that people could look up players and evaluate them between, between each other based on their added goal value. So that's what I have. Uh, check out my work on, on my website here, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. We'll now take a few questions from our judges. Check, check. <laughs> uh, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, clutchness? In other words, in some sports, the, the claim is there isn't any. Yeah. You're making a big claim. Yeah. And it must be, you know, collinear with a lot of your measure with a lot of other things. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, the inspiration for the paper was the win probability added metric in baseball, which you might be familiar with. And that's known to not actually do a very good job of correlating between seasons. Um, the, the novelty here with my research is that um, it does correlate across seasons. So, so it seems like I'm tapping into something that is some sort of innate quality. Um, I call it clutchness, but, um, but it just means that certain players are getting opportunities to score big goals in big moments. And something else I should emphasize is that, you know, something that I think um, I, the reception I've gotten the last day um, talking about this research is this concern that certain players potentially get more opportunities maybe at the end of games if you're a big goal scorer. And, and the two reasons I think that isn't a problem with this metric is that the biggest shifts in win probability, they happen when the game is tied or when it's within one goal. And empirically, that's about 75% of NHL games. So most players are getting a lot of time on the ice when they can make a big impact by scoring a big goal. The other thing I should say is that if you're concerned about the last couple minutes of the game and it's tied and you know, your elite goal scorers are gonna be on the ice, that's where I would, I would emphasize that you only want to be comparing apples to apples. You want to be comparing the Alex Ovechkins who are going to get those opportunities to the Sidney Crosbys who are going to get those opportunities, not Ovechkin to some fourth line player who would never see the ice in that situation. So, so using the metric takes a little bit of knowledge about your players, but, but the idea though is that it's useful for distinguishing between players that are really tough to, to distinguish between. Thank you. You have another question here? Yeah, it's maybe kind of following up <clears throat> along the same lines, mm -hmm. but you know, when you say there's a correlation from year to year, I mean mm -hmm. there's a correlation in goals scored from yeah. year to year. It's pretty strong. So how yeah. you decompose the clutch component yeah. and decompose, you know, kind of per opportunity instead of right. just on a, as counting stat? So, yeah. So the so the way that I the way that I deal with this in the paper, and I obviously didn't have time to actually present the stats, but basically the way the metric works is that I take ev a player every goal that they score um, in a season and get the added probability from those goals and take the sum of that. So I know the total sum of their probabilities. But you're right, that's kind of just an accounting uh, identity that if you score more goals, you'll have higher. So what I do is I subtract off the expected increase in win probability. So, so empirically, like I said, the average goal in the NHL increases the team's chances by winning 17 percentage points. So from that total added probability, I subtract off 17% times the number of goals they scored. So that this allows you to compare players who have similar rates, but, but takes out this concern that all I'm really picking up in terms of the correlation is, you know, players who score a lot of goals in one year are gonna score a lot of goals in the next. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks. Thank you Steven. Uh, next up, we have our basketball finalists. This can, uh, please join me in welcoming Alexander Franks and Andrew Miller to the stage. So, Red Auerbach once said that basketball is like war, in that offensive weapons are developed first, and it always takes a while for defense to catch up. The same is true for basketball analytics. There's a striking lack of defensive metrics in the NBA. And so let's look at a clip to think about the consequences of that. In this clip, James Harden is guarding Kawhi Leonard. And at the start of the possession, he gets lost in a crowd. And then 
is able to recover and chase Kawhi off the line, but overcommits and gives up an open jumper that's eventually made. So day in and day out, as a fan or a coach, we see examples of this uh, that we recognize as either bad defense or good defense. But most importantly, this is never recorded statistically. So oops. our goal is to correct for this imbalance of defensive metrics in the NBA and catch up on defense, with a particular focus on how defenders affect shot selection and shot disruption. Given that a shooter decides to take the shot, how is that defender affecting the probability that it will go in? So player tracking is amazing, but one of the problems is that the raw data itself doesn't tell us much about defense. We have no idea, looking at this animation, what each defender is really doing or what they should be doing. And so really, this is the fundamental problem with defensive analytics in the NBA. In order to characterize defensive skill, we first need to understand defensive intent. And so our approach is to build a model for who's guarding whom every moment of a possession in, uh, in the NBA. We use what's called a hidden Markov model to, to dynamically estimate these uh, matchups. And this is what it looks like in action. Each blue line represents the, match the inferred matchup at any given moment. And you should pay attention in particular to uh, the fact that our model is able to pick up switches and things like double teams. And we can do this for every game in a season. Here there's a foul, and the ball will come back in uh, after the inbound. And in particular, what this allows us to do now is to identify who's matched up against the shooter at every moment of the possession. And I'm going to pass it off to Andy, who will talk about how we can use that. So the contribution of this paper is to build an ensemble of new defensive metrics built on top of that who's guarding whom model in order to uh, attempt to quantify the disruption and suppression um, of, of defense. So we know how many points Chris Paul scores throughout the course of a game. It's easily counted. Uh, but how many points does he give up throughout the course of the game? We aim to estimate this notion um, counterpoints. Um, how many points can we actually say that Chris, is uh, Chris Paul is responsible for uh, giving up? And similarly for field goal attempts, how many shots uh, did Chris Paul give up over the course of that game? How many shots against uh, did his defense cause or suppress? And using that who's guarding whom model, we can break the possession down into different regimes, different temporal regimes. For instance, we can look at the late possession and see the matchup at the moment of the shot and uh, count the number of times uh, a particular defender is shot against over, say, 100, 100 half-court possessions. And when we do this, we see that big men like Roy Hibbert, uh, for instance, is shot against over, over 100 possessions 42 times, nearly 42 times. Um, so it's a, it's a measure of kind of how many shots they'll, they'll face uh, based on this who's guarding whom model at the late possession. But we can also look at the early possession, which is somewhat more interesting. Um, we found that uh, James Harden's initial matchup, 25% of the time will end up being the shooter, uh, which is one of the highest in the NBA. And another way to look at it is to kind of average over the entire possession account for all of the defense that has been played against, say, Steph Curry over the course of the possession. So if, uh, if Chris Paul is guarding Steph Curry for nine seconds out of a 10-second possession, and Steph Curry hits a step back three, then we'll give 90% of those points to, say, Chris Paul. That's another way to kind of divide the possession up and divide responsibility up. Certainly not the way, but another way that we can do it now that we have this who's guarding whom model. We can summarize games. So this is the, what we're terming the bat, uh, matchup box score for the December 25th game between the Rockets and the Spurs from the clip that we saw earlier. In it, we summarize the fractional matchup, so how often a particular defender was guarding a particular offender, and uh, how many points against, how many of those fractional points against that we computed over the course of the game. We can extend this idea to the entire season. We can say for 100 half-court possessions, how many shots against and how many counterpoints did a particular defensive player face. And among guards here in blue, um, we found that Chris Paul was quite suppressive and quite disruptive. And among big men, kind of the dots in red, we found that Roy Hibbert faced, while he faced many, many shots, he was kind of in the middle of the pack for points against, uh, kind of providing evidence of his disruptive score. But these simple observables don't really account for uh, disparities in player skill. Um, so, for instance, if you're guarding Rajon Rondo and he goes two for five from the three-point line that night, what does that say about your defensive performance? 
Um, and alternatively, if you are guarding Steph Curry and he goes two for five from the three-point line, uh, that says something a little different about your defensive performance. Um, so we aim to control for that uh, phenomenon. And in order to do so, we, uh, we built a pretty uh, a somewhat involved multinomial logistic regression model with uh, fixed player effects accounting for offensive and defensive skill um, where we can interpret those parameters as uh, suppressive and uh, disruptive for the particular defenders. Um, and because this model is so involved and uh, is pretty high, high dimensional, we came up with a way to visualize it um, that we're terming defensive shot charts that uh, Alice will describe. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So using the outputs of those models, we can introduce the defensive shot chart. So with the offensive shot chart, uh, dots represent regions where an offensive player is more likely to shoot. In the defensive shot chart, dots represent areas in which the, the defender more often faces shots. Here, we color the dots by the defender's effect on oppose, opposing players' efficiency. Red meaning that player is hot, blue meaning that shooter is cold. So here, we can see that uh, above the break, all of these red, relatively large dots, which is suggesting that opponents tend to exhibit both greater shot uh, activity above the break and shot efficiency relative to the a uh, average defender when, faced, when facing James Harden. Compare that to somebody like Kawhi Leonard, who has all of these tiny dots above the break, indicating that he's actually doing a very good job at suppressing three-point shots relative to the average defender. And I don't know if you can tell, but these dots are also blue, which means that when the shooter does take the shot, he's actually reducing those, the efficiency of those shots relative to the average player. So we've spent a lot, lot of time talking about individual metrics, but we have to remember, of course, that defense is a team effort. Um, and, and so here, the first thing you should notice is that there's a lot of blue. This is the uh, starting five from the Indiana Pacers, who were the league's best uh, defensive team last year. So Andy mentioned how, uh, whoops, what? sorry. Uh, Andy mentioned how Roy Hibbert is contesting 42% of all shots. And that's evidenced by this high density of, of dots in the paint. Well, your teammates' uh, abilities are going to affect your own statistics. And so one of the things we might realize is that the Pacers are a really good perimeter defensive team. So perhaps they're funneling a lot of the shooters towards Roy Hibbert, who's one of the best big men in the league. And that's uh, reflected by that high volume, but then also the blue dots reflecting the fact that he's actually a great defender and disrupting those shots more than almost any other player in the NBA. And so we've introduced a, a broad suite of metrics here. Um, and if a team wanted to use that, we could incorporate uh, team strategy into these models. We can also think about how much attention a particular offensive player draws um, by looking at how often they're being guarded or how the uh, def defenders affect things like the expected possession value. So just to wrap up, five years ago, we saw that offensive shot charts were really not part of the discourse in the NBA. Now they're everywhere. Well, maybe five years from now, we'll see uh, that we'll lament the time when these defensive metrics were not a bigger part uh, of our discourse, in, in part things like uh, the defensive shot charts and counterpoints we've introduced. So this is defense catching up. Thank you. And we'll now take a round of questions from our judges. <laughs> so could you elaborate a little on how the model handles the 10 second, nine second issue that you talked about earlier? Yeah. Um, so I think part of the broader point is that assigning blame is a, difficult, is a difficult thing. And so we're not trying to sort of answer that question once and for all. But what we're saying is that if you look at, you can learn things by looking at different point, uh, parts of the possession. So if you look at the moment that the shot is taken, you're learning more about the big men. For instance, who's doing the most to contest shot. If you look at the beginning of the possession, you can actually learn something interesting like James Harden seems to get lost a lot on defense. And Regardless of how that happens, we're seeing that people are shooting against him more often than not. And that's where the initial ma possession uh, matchup matters. Um, so you, know, you can also imagine all sorts of different weighting schemes. So one of the ones we looked at was this, this fractional points against, 
where we just count the fraction of time you're guarding the score and assign you exactly um, those points. Yeah. And we saw some interesting effects, like Chris Paul comes out uh, really well there. So yeah. it, you know, I think it's just taking it as a whole, what can we learn from different ways of thinking about this? I once saw a video of Steph Curry's all his three-point shots in a single season, mm -hmm. and the, the most interesting part were the flyby defenders. How do you treat that? Is that, a, is that a, an effort at prevention, or is it just something kind of stupid? Uh, yeah. Do they get extra credit or non-credit <laughs> for being flyby? I think, uh, so I think that's a really good question. In our model, um, Defender, defender identity, of course, matters, but defender distance uh, has a huge effect on the efficiency, and that's explicitly built in. So um, you can imagine extending our model in various ways. Uh, so um, if, if it's a flyby, but he's really flying by and getting his hand in the face at the exact moment that this player tracking records the shot happening, we might expect that to be good defense. Um, if there's a flyby like we saw in the, the Kawhi play, well, what happens is he takes a step forward, suddenly the defender distance is increasing, he's got an open shot. So I think we do, do capture uh, some of that effect. And, and over the course of many possessions, do we fit that model on over 100,000 possessions? And uh, that kind of flyby behavior will be, in average, picked up, um, of course, by, by that model. By that, by that, so. so you might see that James Harden is, on average, further Flying, from, more. from the shooter when he takes the shot, if, if he's really doing that a lot. And that'll result in more points against, on average. This will be the last question. So how do you decide what the right answer is as far as who's guarding who? Because you have lots of data. It's very rich data. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you looking and doing a gut check and watching the tape and saying, this makes sense? But how do you, mm -hmm. how do you train that model? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is covered in the paper. We didn't have a lot of time to go into it. Um, but we started, this, we started with this simple idea that on average, the defender is in this triangle formed by the player he's guarding, the hoop, and the ball. And we can actually use our model, hidden Markov model, to identify what that position is on average, and then smooth over, over time. Um, so one of the things that you can do is we can, we can use the eye test, essentially. Compare it to the video, see if it kind of makes sense. But the other thing we do is we actually do out-of-sample prediction. So we can say, does it help uh, for us to predict the outcome of a shot or the location an identity of the shooter when we incorporate defensive information, and we see that it actually makes a big difference. Yeah, both models, we did a, a fair amount of model checking in that sense, and we looked at a lot of possessions um, yeah, to pass the eye test. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Um, please join me in thanking Alexander Franks and Andrew Miller. Thank you, fellas. Thanks, guys. Next, we'd like to welcome to the stage uh, our finalists in the baseball track, which is Scott Spratt and Joe Morales. Yeah. Yeah. So that. Yeah. Everyone, I'm Scott Spratt. This is Joe Rosales. We work at Baseball Info Solutions. Uh, they'll pull up our, our slideshow in a second, I think. Um, but we, uh, the central piece of our research here today is talking about who is responsible for a called strike. And catcher framing has been a very popular topic in recent seasons. Um, we actually heard about it a little bit earlier in some of the earlier panels. And I, we all have this sort of clear idea of what it is for a catcher to frame a pitch. It's that, that ar archetypical pitch where it's just off the outside corner of the plate. You see the catcher receive the pitch on the outside and then make that subtle movement with his glove to get back over the heart of the zone to make it appear that that pitch actually crossed over the corner of the plate. But that's, that's not always how it works. Um, we have a couple of video examples here in a second on the, on the second slide that show situations where even though the pitch may have fallen within the strike zone, they were called balls, and it may not have been because of, mm -hmm. it may not have been because the, 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 uh, the catcher made any drastic movement here. It may have been instead, uh, instead because there were other factors at play. So will you play those videos, please? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, in these other examples, we have a situation where uh, a, a Franklin Morales throws a pitch that covers the heart of the plate, but because the pitch was set up over the outside corner, he... Um, I, just, well, just go ahead. Yeah, if we describe the pitches, basically there's, yeah. there's many different things that can happen. So as Scott said, you can, 
a, a catcher can frame a pitch with his subtle movements. What he, you know, can also happen is a pitcher might throw a pitch that goes right out over the heart of the plate. And through no fault of the catchers at all, the pitch might end up being called a strike because the catcher may have been set up way outside and had to whip his glove back over because the pitcher missed by so much. And then there's other instances where you know, the, the body, the body uh, mannerisms of a, of a hitter, you know, trying to deke a, a, an umpire can have an effect. Sometimes the umpires themselves have certain tendencies that, uh, that they just happen to call more strikes than, than, um, than average or, or, uh, or not. And then what we're really getting at here is that the catcher isn't the only player or the only party involved in calling a pitch that's responsible for drawing those extra strikes or extra balls. In fact, the pitcher, the catcher, the batter, and the umpire can all be involved. Um, a lot of the traditional uh, catcher framing methodologies, however, have relied only on the catcher or used those other parties only as adjustments for the catcher. And the goal of our research, which became strike zone plus minus, was to incorporate and evaluate all four parties and, and specifically measure them. It's unique in that sense, and it's also unique in some of the data that we use as variables on the input, which I'll talk through one at a time here. The ones that we found to be most significant were the pitch location, the ball and strike count, the pitch command, and the batter hand in this. And in addition, we also looked at other potential variables, pitcher hand in this, pitch type, and home road splits. But after incorporating those original four, we found that they didn't have as much of an impact and weren't necessary in the model. So let's start with pitch location. This is really the, the fundamental piece here that's the most obvious. And you can see from this, this chart we have here, if you're throwing a pitch that's in the heart of the zone, almost always that's going to become a strike. And if you throw a pitch that's well off the outside corner, that's almost going to always be called a ball. It doesn't really matter what the other parties are doing to impact that pitch. Um, however, when you get very close to the edges, and that's the yellow regions that you're seeing on the chart here, we can have some gray areas. And, and those parties can have impacts such that not all pitches in the zone are always called strikes, and not all pitches outside the zone are always called balls. Next, we saw a component here with ball and strike count that sort of matches your perception of baseball. As the count more and more favors the pitcher, an umpire is going to tend to benefit the batter with fewer strike calls or extra ball calls. And conversely, in a situation where the count starts to benefit the hitter, uh, especially in like a 3-0 count, for instance, the umpire is going to be very willing to call an extra strike in situations where they wouldn't always. Third, pitch command. This is actually based on some data that we collected, Baseball Info Solutions, where we chart where the catcher's mitt is located on, uh, uh, before a pitch is thrown. And by using that relative to the actual location of the pitch itself, we can uh, figure out exactly how good the command of a given pitch was. We actually split this up horizontally for, for our formula here, such that if, if the horizontal distance between the pitch and the original uh, target are very low, then that represents very good command. And we found that pitches are more likely to be called strikes when there's very good command on the pitch, even if that pitch is actually outside of the traditional strike zone. And as the command gets worse and worse, like that Franklin Morales example where it's actually down the heart of the plate, but not nearly where the catcher was set up, there's more likely to be called a ball in those circumstances. And finally, batter handedness is an important variable as well. And it works for both batters the same way, such that um, if a ball is over the inside part of the plate, then the umpire is more likely to call balls in those counts or in those situations. And if it's over the outside part of the plate, uh, the umpire is more likely to call strikes. Now Joe's going to take you through the methodology and the results. Um, right. So given these four uh, variables that Scott was just talking about, we can calculate the expected likelihood of a pitch being called a strike. So here's just an example of a pitch. You know, if we're talking about a pitch that's an inch off the outside edge of the plate, 10 inches off the ground in a 2-1 count, um, six inches from the, the catcher's target to a left-handed batter, there's uh, a 40, we've calculated there's a 43% likelihood of that pitch being called a strike. And this is where this, the concept of the plus minus comes in. If that pitch ends up being called a strike, there's uh, positive credit to be given, so that's the plus. If the pitch ends up being called a ball, there's negative credit to be given, um, and that's the minus. Uh, so basically, if you, you know, that, that amount of credit depends on what the likelihood is of that pitch being called a strike. So, you know, in this case, if that pitch had been called a ball, that's 0.43 strikes that would be lost uh, on that pitch, or if this pitch were called a strike, that would be 0.57 strikes that were gained on that pitch. And then the way that our methodology works um, in terms of apportioning that, that credit for that pitch amongst the four parties that we're talking about, um, it's kind of similar to some you know, strength of scheduling ranking systems that you might be familiar with. Basically, we take this iterative approach where for the first iteration, you know, um, not knowing anything about the particular tendencies of the parties involved, 
Um, whenever we look at, a, at an individual pitch, we're going to divide that credit up evenly among um, all four, the batter, the pitcher, the catcher, and the umpire. Um, once we've done that for every single pitch in a given season, you know, we'll add up all those pluses and minuses for every player, and uh, you know, at the end, we'll end up with certain players are going to have, come out with a net positive. Um, those, those are the players that, at least on this initial indication, are going to suggest that they are more capable of getting extra strikes called um, than average. And then those that have a net negative, you know, those are the guys that uh, have a tendency of, um, of ha having more balls called while they're involved. Uh, and then we can use those tendencies to essentially um, you know, iterate on, you know, we'll make adjustments on the, the credits that we're apportioning. Uh, you know, instead of dividing it up evenly between the four, we're, we can make adjustments based on those tendencies. Um, with a second iteration, we're going to get different results. Um, we can just basically keep looping it back, you know, over and over. The, the changes in those results will keep getting smaller and smaller until we finally converge on something that reflects um, an accurate apportion, apportioning of, of uh, or accrediting of um, what uh, a, a given player contributes to that particular pitch. Um, and then we're going to convert those to runs. You'll see that's what the, uh, the run value at the bottom, that's the, the value of converting a, a pitch from a ball to a strike. Um, so the, those plus minus credits at the end will be then be turned into a run value using that point two conversion. Uh, just running through some examples um, from the 2014 seasons. Uh, one th key thing to note here is that with um, catchers, because we're dividing the, the credit up this way, um, there's uh, compared to other catcher framing methodologies, our results come in uh, with more modest run values, uh, run saved values, um, which I think sort of matches some of the, uh, you know, there's the skepticism that's always been out there about uh, some of the high values that, that catcher framing has typically been considered to be worth. Um, so that's why we feel like our system is, is doing a, a better job of apportioning that credit. Um, pitchers, uh, they uh, tend to, um, on a per-pitch basis, they're not that uh, different in terms of their contributions necessarily from catchers, but because they're involved in so, much, so many fewer pitches, uh, their aggregated totals over a given year aren't quite uh, as high, but they're still um, uh, discernible. Hitters, here the thing to note would just be that um, here uh, the positive numbers for hitters are actually bad for them because it, those positive numbers are indicating that they're more likely to uh, have strikes be called when they're at the plate. Um, so therefore, negative numbers are actually good for hitters. Uh, those are the guys that are um, able to get sort of more balls called while they're at the plate. Uh, if we look at uh, umpires, these, are, these guys are also fairly significant just because of the number of pitches that they're involved. And they show very discernible tendencies. Um, the interesting example here is, is Bill Miller. Uh, he's actually um, somebody that every year that we've been calculating this for, uh, he, he consistently comes out on top of the list, you know, either one or two. And um, he, you know, we, we put this stuff in these, these numbers in place, you know, for this past season. And, you know, looking at the results, you know, we see Bill Miller, and that's interesting. And then when we uh, got to the uh, wild card game last year, the AL wild card game, um, Bill Miller got the call behind the plate. And, it was very interesting to see that uh, our numbers sort of play out in, in terms of, the, of what actually happened in the game. Now, uh, these, we, these are video clips as well, which, which may not work, but I'll, I'll just sort of briefly uh, describe them. Um, basically, what happened in this game is, uh, you know, in, in three instances when uh, the Royals were on the mound, um, there were pitches that ended up well down off the plate, well off the outside edge. Um, and Bill Miller was ringing these guys up for strikeouts. But, you know, we know that it wasn't necessarily the Royals that were specifically, say, achieving that uh, from him. He was that it, it was something that Bill, oh, you can, all right, here we go. So this is the first one, well down off the plate, you know, strikeout. Uh, that cl pitched clearly a ball. That was in the second inning of the game. The second one happens uh, in the fifth inning where um, this pitch isn't quite as far off the plate, but is still you know, a pitch that um, easily could have been called a ball. And you know, Bill Miller, he's, and at which I, I guess I didn't necessarily mention specifically at the beginning of those, those positive numbers for, for, uh, for umpires indicate pitcher-friendly umpires. And you can see how pitcher-friendly he is. Again, ringing up Coco Crisp on a pitch well down and out of the zone. Now, those were all with the Royals on the mound. But here, you can see he's, he's uh, an equal opportunity strike caller with a pitch well up and out of the zone. Uh, there with John Lester getting the strikeout. So um, 
basically what was really interesting is, is this did play out and it shows how much of a, of a clear tendency that uh, all of these have. Now, um, just sort of getting through, you know, this is still going to be most important for catchers, you know, and we can sort of talk about uh, various catchers that have, um, you know, guys like Yadi Molina, we, we've known they win all awards. We know that they're the greatest catchers in the world. But, you know, Jonathan Lucroy and, and catchers of his ilk, you know, now we're, we're able to sort of better appreciate their abilities because uh, they can, um, because of this skill. And this is just sort of a quick thing, you know, total runs. Um, you can see how Molina is sort of good across the board, but now that we know something about uh, this um, catcher framing skill, uh, Lucroy is somebody that we can appreciate similarly. All right, thank you, guys. Uh, we'll take questions from our judges. So I could imagine a pitcher would want credit for the command, um, but that seems like that's sort of being taken out because that's controlled for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, there are actually two potential things at play here. On an individual pitch, we're, we're basically using the command as a way to decide whether that specific pitch deserves or like is more or less likely to be called a strike. But you can also imagine a situation where maybe the, like the reputational command or the consistency of command of a pitcher over time is actually influencing whether or not umpires are giving them more or fewer strikes. Um, and I feel like if you are a pitcher that's able to hit those edges, consistently, that may be one of the major reasons why those pitchers are getting extra strike calls over time beyond just the quality of that individual pitch's command. Can you talk a little bit about whether the rankings changed of the catchers or that it was more that it muted the value of the pitch framing? OK, so you're saying relative to some other framing methodologies that are out there. Um, I would say. For the most part, many of the guys at the top of our list are similar to the guys that are, that are at the top of the other list. Um, but I do think that we've uncovered some new, some changes based on the other parties that are involved. One major example I would have there is with the Mariners. Mike Zanino is an excellent um, pitch framer as a catcher, but if you saw on the leaderboard, Hisashi Iwakuma and Felix Hernandez were actually two pitchers that were at the top of that list. And if those were numbers that were entirely be, being given to the catcher's credit, it would make Zanino look a lot better because he's actually benefiting from a staff of pitchers that are getting extra strikes in addition to getting those himself. So we did see certain catchers that went up or went down because of those other factors that were consistently playing a part in their ability to frame pitches. All right, thank you guys. That's all the time we have. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, next up, we have the winner in the business of sports track. Please join me in welcoming Professor Clayton Graham. Okay. Hi, I'm Clay Graham. I'm an adjunct uh, professor at uh, DePaul University. And we're going to be talking about diamonds on the line. We're talking about gambling. First of all, why are we here? First of all, we want to build an analytical model to represent the ball game with the purpose of identifying which team we should bet on and how much should we bet. Subject to maximizing a 30-day moving average of expected profits, subject to economic constraint and risk tolerances. Sniff and kick, what's cooking? We have to do some research. First thing I did was go to the bowels of the Caesar's Palace and picked up a crack team of experts. Now these guys, you can see immediately, they know exactly what's going on. But I needed computational power. So I talked to a friend of mine at Wharton who offered me their high speed, very modern computer system. And so we're now we're putting the pieces together. Did you know, in betting on baseball, 70% of the time, the home team is favored. They win 54% of the time. This is called overrated. In contrast, the road team is only favored 30% of the time and wins 46%. Undervalued. These are principal concepts that we're dealing with betting is identifying which things are overvalued and underrated. Gambling is big. There are two estimates. 
One is from a bookmaker that estimates that worldwide sports gambling is approximately a trillion dollars. The other is a reputable source you may have heard of called ESPN, where they estimate about $600 million. Either case, it's huge. But perhaps more importantly, 80% of the betting is illegal. How it works. We're mapping a path. We're going from ideas to execution. On the, we're going to have three tracks up here. The first thing we're going to be looking at is the, the line and what it means and converting the line to eventually a probability of winning, an implied probability of winning. Next, we're going to look at the game and to building a production function, trying to measure exactly what the run output is going to be and looking at the distribution functions which are not traditionally uh, taken into consideration. And again, we want to find out what the probability of winning is. It's the edge we're looking at, which is the, between the line probability of winning and the game probability of winning. We grind those things, two things together, and then we bring in a bunch of filters to narrow the type of games that we're looking at to raise the probability of winning. Our objective, we want to capitalize on the market inequities between the game and the line. The money line. How many people know what the money line is? Okay, pretty good. How many know what the spread is? How many know what the over-under is? Pretty good. How many know what the grand salami is? Those are the diehards. Okay. We are only going to be looking at the money line today, only the money line. In this example, we have a road team. In this particular case, we're going to go with the uh, Seattle Mariners and the Detroit Tigers on August 16th. The line for the Seattle Mariners is minus 113. Uh, Felix Hernandez was pitching, one of the great right-handers in the game. They are favored, and it means you risk $113 to make 100. In contrast, the home team was at 105, they're the underdog, and you would risk $100 to make 105. Here we derive our prob implied probability of winning, which is basically the cost over the cost plus the payout. And the thing is you notice here is that the total is over 100. That's basically the juice that's being paid to the house. And here we normalize it so the sum is 100, and we come up with the probabilities of winning based on the line. That's part one where we want to be. Number two, what does winning look like? Winning is not normal. It is skewed and it has a long tail. Some like the girls I used to date in college, but that's another matter. Here you can see a gamma distribu uh, distribution of the winning lines between 2007 and 2014. And you can see that the favorite wins about 60% of the time and the underdog about 40% of the time with the median line at 100, minus 115. Now we rely on some of the great minds of the Western world, in particular that great Western philosopher Yogi Berra. It's tough to make prediction, especially about the future. We're in the future prediction business. Baseball's Pythagorean theorem, well known, the uh, runs for the home team squared over the sum of the product of the runs of the home and the away team. This is the basic thing we've seen before and is generally used of looking at historical data rather than the future, but we're using it to look ahead. What goes into the game? We're looking at an input-output function, singles, doubles, triples, homers, base on balls, but we're looking on, at percentages so we make things relative and comparable between them. And, once we, and we're using runs per out rather than runs per game. Games can have as little as five innings, as many as 25 or so. So runs per game is really not meaningful. We want to make sure that we look at comparable type of numbers. And likewise, from the runs per out, we can get to runs per game by multiplying by 27. This is a regression formula, and I just am pointing it out for a couple of reasons. Number one, that we have to force a zero intercept when we are considering those input variables. We do want to give credit to a, a team or a player for doing something they didn't earn. So they have to do something, either a single, double, triple, homer, or base on balls. Now, 
looking at the distribution, did a curve fitting on this for runs per out, and it fits the gamma distribution. The gamma is a very special distribution in that there are two parameters, the alpha and the beta, but taking a look at the first and second moments, we get the mean and average, and solving a couple of equations, we get the alpha and beta parameters in terms of the mean and variance. This allows us to go forward and determine the full scaling of the gamma function. Matchups. Consistent with my policy of showing no more than five items on a slide, I just want to point out the top line, which talks about time, variance, and ranking. Here we look at the variance for each team at home and away for runs scored and runs allowed. And you'll see on the upper left hand corner is a time parameter. Time is one of the most in things going on. Do you take it for the whole season, half season, or what portion of it? Not a simple thing to determine. More importantly, using that you're able to uh, use the additive pro uh, property of variance to get the variance for each team in this particular game. This is now getting to the point where the wheat, and when I separate the wheat from the chaff, we talk about several different variables that we want to filter out in order to take a look at what things really contribute to what's going on. And if, if the teams do not meet these criteria, which are rerun virtually every week or so, you, you can eliminate different teams from actually betting upon. Here is one of the interesting things using a thing I call Rankmeister where it looks at the ranking of the team for the given period of time in terms of offense, defense, runs allowed, runs given up. And you can see in this particular thing, I ran it for 64 days and 108 days with completely opposite answers. It came out for the home team with a net ranking benefit of 13 for 64 and a negative six for 108. You get inconsistent measures when you use different time. So the question becomes, what time do you use? And doing this for quite a while, we learned that the numbers generally come out between 60 and 70 teams in an optimizing methodology. Here shows the filters and how they show up for the expected runs per game, strikeouts per base and balls, and the on base plus slugging. So you see all these little animals going around meeting together. We consider the characteristics of the park factor, and that's a relatively easy one to incorporate. Now we're going to go into Monte Carlo simulation. Instead of using points for expected values, remember we're able to create the density function for alpha and beta for both the road and home team, and we're going to look at runs. So here we have the long tails and the skewness for the two distributions at the top. Top left is the Seattle Mariners. Top right is the Detroit Tigers. Huge difference when you see the picture of what's going on. You cannot use point estimates and accurately represent exactly what's happening. Up below, we see the distribution of run differences. And if you take a look, what is greater than zero? You come out with 57%. Now we do the same thing for the Pythagorean uh, approach to it. And we're using the density functions accordingly for that. And here you see a very unusual density function on the lower half, and things tend to go to the corners. And one reason is that uh, the density functions leading into it are so diverse. So you get a very bimodal type of characteristic. And look at the three together. You see the first two are very similar using Monte Carlo, and using just expected values, you see 63% as compared to basically 58%. And in gambling and anything of this nature, you want to make sure that you have consistency. And here we have, what, 58 to 53, you talk about a 5% difference. That's huge in gambling. We want to look at the edge. That's where we want to be. We got the two probabilities, winning and then the uh, normalized implied. There was work done by um, uh, Joe Pita a couple years ago in the book Trading Bases, where he showed an investment function which was really predicated on winning between 55 and 58% of the time. We were doing considerably better than that because of our filtering process. So we built another function that we could adjust it and go on up and to the right of exactly what's going on. So we had this little thing where we wanted to take a look each day based on the edge, what should we invest? And you see on the far right, it'll show the percent of bankroll 
that you invest depending on the characteristics of that particular situation. And then likewise, you just have to go down to the bottom, move it up and down for whatever the edge is for that game, and see how much you should invest. The thing that's scary, if it looks too good to be true, it usually is. You know, and it came out that you can have big differences between the implied probability and the actual probability. When it gets too far, you stretch that rubber band too much, and they usually frequently end up being something you want to avoid, like the plague. And we developed uh, keeping track of all that and built that into the model. Does it work? Looking between uh, June to uh, August, how many people were you satisfied in making an investment where you doubled your money in two months? Nobody wants that. Those must be the Harvard guys, I guess. So, but this is, and I'm showing this on this scale graph, is the next one. You see the line, that's where that is. Because here we're able to uh, increase our uh, pro, uh, double, not double, 10 times our payroll in four months. Not too bad. Then we got to the end of the season. Feeling real good. And that, if we look overall, we had a winning percentage of 68%. Average daily return on risk, ca capital risk, was 35%. Overall return on original bankroll, 1,400. Average bets per day, less than two. Average bet size, three and a half percent of the bankroll. The percent of the games invested, only 23. And the edge, if you just bet flat line betting as compared to betting according to the investment function, you actually doubled your profitability. Modeling contributions. Runs per hour enhanced by the accuracy of the model. Game day batting uh, batters versus starting pitcher matchup effectively uh, fed into the production function. Now you're gonna see things that are bold. All these other items you can actually apply to other sports, any team sports. Road home variance, critical. Dynamic time vari variables drive the algorithm. Monte Carlo technique, you saw how that made a difference. And we use genetic programming to mix it all into one big pot. Go where the numbers take you. I don't know if you saw the movie Back to the Future. They predicted the Chicago Cubs were gonna win the World Series in 2015. This is the year, this is the year. You can do analytics and you can still be a fan. I'm still a fan of the Cubs and that takes guts. Okay, now for some of your phenomenal questions. Thank you. So I have a lot of questions. Uh, the answer is 16. <laughs> the only question is the decimal point. Um, I mean, isn't this whole thing too good to be true? Yes, it is. Yeah. How much have you actually tested the, using real money, betting in advance, and not back testing? No, it, it is not too good to be true. I've been doing this for 10 years. And traditionally, I've been uh, getting between 8 and 11% a day return. This year, I took a different method to being more specific, enhancing my filters. And these are real numbers, except you better multiply a, by a pretty big factor. This is all done with real dollars. OK, but is there proof of that? Because it just seems extremely implausible to me. Show you the bank account. Yeah. OK. Professor Tufty. Uh, could you answer Nate's questions again? <laughs> <laughs> Same answer. Yeah, yeah no, uh, I, this is an evolutionary process. I've been doing this for over 10 years, uh, and I've been doing it in a multitude of sports. Baseball has been the most effective, and this year was literally beyond comprehension when I started doing the pi uh, batter-pitcher matchup and then using the production function to get the expected value of runs for the, the game. It just, the numbers blew my mind and I was winning so much, it was just, it was really scary. Now the test will be, will it work next year? This is the first year I really did it, and I, and, but I did back test it for uh, four or five years. 
this is not normal stuff. All right, and that's all the time we have. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Graham. Uh, this concludes our live judging. The results will be announced later today at the Alpha Awards. Thank you for coming.